What's up YouTube, capital G here, giving you guys a quick recap as to what the heck happened at YCS Anaheim. For starters, it was actually a pretty sizable event. A lot of events in California just tend to be very large. I think um, about two months ago, they had a regional in California that was like a thousand people. I was going to predict that this event was gonna be about 14 to 1500. It ended up being closer to 1800, uh, 1769. So definitely a very big event. Um, as far as is what won well abc took the crown it's kind of interesting because a lot of people have been saying that abc is a deck that's kind of trending down that it's not that good it's easily counterable and i think that the general conception that abc isn't a very strong deck is just uh, the fact that everyone is so focused on it everyone sides so much and then the fact that it didn't win uh, ycs liverpool i think that was kind of just an eyebrow raiser but a lot of times even what people think is going to be like like the best deck it doesn't usually win the first ycs that it's legal for i remember um when what was that set uh one of those uh gx sets uh order of chaos came out and insectors and windups were both really big and plus we had dino rabbits and everyone thought that those decks were going to end up winning like the ycs atlanta and like tg stun one and everybody was like what the hell and it's like oh yeah three copies of skill drain just shuts off everything in the meta so it isn't that surprising that abc didn't win ycs liverpool when you have pk fire players literally main decking you know things like chaos hunter you know what i mean a card that is basically Basically useless against most of the meta matchups it just absolutely dominates abc so abc actually not only won the event but abc had the uh, abc had the best in day two they had nine out of 32 which is it's pretty good it's kind of close to it's not quite a third of the um of the top cup but obviously it's a pretty significant amount metaphos was right behind it with seven and then to me the story of this entire event was just the rise of totally awesome this is a card that everyone has acknowledged is probably the best card out of Invasion Vengeance. It's an amazing card. I think about two months ago or so, I said that uh, it was a very strong chance that it was going to be a meta-defining card, and I think most people just kind of agreed with that because they just saw the fact that it was like a walking Cyber Dragon Infinity, uh, the fact that it could summon low-level monsters like Swap Frog and Dupe Frog from your deck. Uh, not only could you negate things, but then you could take your opponent's negation, or excuse me, you can take the card that you had just negated from your opponent, and then on top of that, it replaced it. So it was just an all-around bonkers card, but if you looked at um, outside of Metaphos and ABC, you see there were five paleozoics in day two there were three mermail and then there were three totally hero guys and uh that's actually that's about 11 out of the top 32 that's about one third of the top cut was playing totally awesome and that is just really really huge uh as far as heroes go i know this is a deck that a lot of people thought you know i, I said that i thought it was going to be one of the best decks of the format people were like oh come on cap it's just it's nothing but hype you're sitting here you're hyping this terrible deck up and i said look man the ocg they couldn't play this deck that's the reason why you never saw it being like dominant over there is because they don't have Norton. Norton and Totally Awesome never existed at the same time. And lo and behold, guys, if you actually look at the top eight, actually two Totally Heroes ended up making it. In fact, if you look at this entire top eight, one, two, uh, three, four, five decks, like five of the top eight was playing totally, uh, totally awesome. So that card it definitely made its uh, impact felt. And another cool thing is when you look at this entire top 32 breakdown, there are just so many different decks, uh, Metaphos, Yang Zing, ABC, uh, Mermil, Heroes, Dark Lords had a very nice showing. Even Blue Eyes is still pretty relevant. The, the ironic thing is, or I guess not ironic, but the odd thing is it seems like uh burning abyss pk fire has kind of been pushed out of the meta i think that uh i think that probably has to do with the fact that if you look at a deck like paleozoic uh, it, it kind of plays the same where you're playing a whole bunch of traps, but it just stuns so much harder. Like, I don't think that a lot of players are scared of a Dante field anymore. Like, even if you have Dante Beatrice, that's just really not that scary anymore. If you back it with a Fog Blade, like most people are playing Twin Twisters, or they can just play through a simple copy of Fog Blade, even if it is a searchable card. So it's a kind of interesting that I thought maybe uh, Winter Cherries would push like Burning Abyss out of the format, but no, it looks like just the rise of stun, the rise of being able to make really cool and really just explosive turn one boards of dank law plus totally awesome plus maybe like a reflasia or a bahamut chart like that is kind of push ba out of the format because i guess it's just a very weak deck going second even a deck like um 
Dark Lords, if it goes first, it can put Christian on the board or it can put the more commonly summoned Vanity Fiend on the board. Uh, speaking of Dark Lords, my goodness, guys, if you watched that feature match with uh, Steven Silverman, by the way, they were tirading that guy for uh, being fat, but I digress. Anyways, if you guys watch that uh, feature match, you guys want to talk about bricking, man. If you think that Monarchs used to brick, you ain't seen nothing yet until you've watched some Dark Lords. Like, this deck is really good and it has a very high ceiling. Um, but the reason I think I stopped playing it on my live stream is the deck is so goddamn prone to bricking. There will be turns or there will be games where you open with like a Superbia plus like a Soul Charge plus like a Vanity's Fiend plus like a Twin Twister and then like some other random card like the one that uh, the Dark Lord that the Dark Lord card that like summons from the graveyard and you're like what can I do with this hand it's completely unplayable I guess I'll just scoop to basically any deck in the meta so Dark Lords is a very good deck um, Vanity's Fiend is super strong but it does tend to kind of lose to itself if you don't get um, like an X tab or a trade in or a desires in your opening hand a lot of times you will just brick city yang zings are back in the meta this is a deck that i thought was going to be very strong just because it's turn one ceiling is very equivalent or probably even higher than something like heroes just because you can make like multiple like den longs you can back them up with their nine branches which is basically like an inferni barrier and you can make titanic galaxy it's a very very strong deck um going first so this was actually a pretty interesting event also one thing to note i know a a lot of players out there are going to probably asked me to talk about the finals. The finals was Paleozoic versus ABC, and it looked like everything was going Paleozoic's way in game three. Um, I mean, he had anti-spell fragrance. He had swap frog. It looks like he was just going to roll to victory, and he activated Pot of Desires and absolutely banished like almost every frog in his deck. So everybody out there who is a hater to Pot of Desires, I know you're pointing at the screen, and you're like, I told you guys so. I told you guys so. And it's just because, um, as Robert Boyajian said, by the way, uh, let me just pause for a second the coverage staff or the coverage for this event was absolutely fantastic they had robert boyajian they had um what's it called uh jerome McHale. they even had billy break doing interviews with the players billy i thought billy break was excellent as far as like the coverage and uh the first time that this is really like uh him commentating for konami i know he, i think he's done like args in the past but anyways back to pot of desires um I know that that card is generally seen as one of the best cards in the game, but it really can be a double-edged sword. And that was just one of those times. I mean, obviously the upside makes up for it, but you know, the fact that he probably activated Pot of Desires 50 times over the weekend and it probably lost him two, you know, two games out of the 50 times that he activated, but it can absolutely happen. So before you guys throw Pot of Desires into every single deck, just think about your combo pieces and think, you know, the possibility of you banishing them, you know, is it worth it? I'm not saying that it's a bad card because it's absolutely um, amazing cards probably top five cards in the game to be honest i don't even think it's stay at three so what do you guys think of this event i thought that this event was fantastic there were lots of people the live stream was absolutely amazing uh abc won the event this was a absolute coming out party for totally awesome it looks like burning abyss has finally maybe been pushed out of the meta across our fingers no dark magicians in day two feels bad man i was hoping that dark magicians would get one spot and um I think the most interesting tech that I saw was a wing dragon of Ross Spear mode. I tried to tell you guys about this card. I'm going to have a discussion on it, but um, the card, it, actually, it's all played by the Metaphos guy who uh, went undefeated in Swiss. Uh, he was actually playing it, and he summoned it a couple of times. He still ended up losing, but it still is an absolutely fantastic card as far as, far as like a, a board cracker or something. It just kind of sucks you can't like pendulum summon it, though. That'd be, that'd be kind of cool. But uh, what do you guys think of the event? I think it was fantastic. Leave that in the comment section below. Oh, one last thing. Shout outs to Slim, uh, Team Slim X Symmetry. He ended up winning uh, the day two regional with, I believe it was his. Uh, it was, a, I think he called it totally Minerva Swarm. It's like a Minerva Swarm, but I think he played like Goldfish so that he could summon like totally, uh, totally awesome is just too good. That card is just fucking bonkers. I'm actually still a little shocked that it's only $50 because it could totally be like a 60 or 80 or $70 card. So anyways, I'm done rambling. If you guys enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. What was your favorite thing about YCS Anaheim? I'll leave that in the comment section below and subscribe if you have not already.
And actually, one last thing. I just want to pose a quick question as to what do you guys think is the best deck of the format right now? I think it's kind of hard to answer that question because eight different decks made day two. I wanted to say Metaphose going into this event, but it just seems like every deck in the entire meta is playing anti-spell fragrance either in the main or in the side deck. And if you just flip that card over against them and they don't instantly out it, like you just give them that Doth Robot and it pangus, 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 like they can't really do much of anything. And it seems like their whole deck falls apart. And then there was one more spicy tech card that i saw that i couldn't actually believe and it was played by the uh, metaphors player who went undefeated 10 and 0 in twist and that was actually genzo and it, it makes a lot of sense it is kind of basically like another denko seka against paleozoics and there were a lot of paleozoics in you know the top cut so it might be a decent card to look into guys not just denko seka but a bigger version of denko essentially genzo so anyways that's the end of the video